I apologize to this entire group for the clickbaity title. The I, I did not originally generate the dashboards are dead title. It, it this was the, the the like tiny bit of backstory here is that I curated a newsletter called the Data Science Roundup, and I linked to a post called Dashboards Are Dead. And what I said about the post in my little blurb was essentially, I don't know that I agree with the conclusions, but I certainly agree with the problem. I thought that the description of the, the problems was insightful and, and also things that we don't often talk about as, as an industry. And so it was an attempt to get a conversation started about some of these, some of these problems. And, and so before diving into the conversation part, I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So I actually copied some of the, some of the writing that I thought was, was useful fodder for thought into these slides. So this is the Oprah style. Hey, everybody gets a dashboard. And I think that a lot of the, the challenge, this is something that we probably all recognize. Somebody asks the data team a question and they get back a dashboard and dashboards are often not the, the best possible way to uh, answer a question. Questions are often best uh, answered with stories and dashboards aren't generally stories. It also means that you've got a ton of tech debt. You've got all these dashboards out there that like, who knows whether they're uh, still current. So there's, there's this dynamic that's going on. There's the fact that inevitably your users want to self-serve. They, yes, you create a dashboard for them, but inevitably they want to be able to ask additional questions. And the filters section of a looker or mode dashboard is not naturally the most flexible experience to go through a self-service process on. And so what, what ends up happening or what, you know, what this person observed was that, you know, the data got exported from the dashboard and then they just went straight to Excel. And then there's this, there's this problem of ownership, you, you know, a dashboard gets created. There's no SLA around it. Is it continuing to be updated in the future? Uh, is it whose responsibility is it to fix if it gets broken, all of this stuff. So I think that these are actually good questions. I tried to kind of summarize what I thought the problems were that, you know, if I was going like to boil all this down, dashboards are expensive to use and uh, are expensive to produce, but we're not, sometimes we're not broadly useful. And so would, would become single use and would, would not, not have an easy deprecation path. The, the dashboards wouldn't be, weren't able to support all the customizability that users wanted. The, the BI tools ultimately weren't as widely adopted as Excel. And that meant that you had this weird hybrid model of who was using what to explore data. Trust, I think was one of the biggest things that came out of this. Users didn't always trust the BI tools and, and dashboards. And by the way, I don't actually know what BI tool that this person was, was using in this context. I don't think it actually matters here. And then there was this big elephant in the room that didn't get talked about too much, but it was, it was brought up almost in passing. There is an indication that people were casting aspersions on the data as a way to kind of redirect the focus from the bad, their, their own bad performance. It's, it's not, it's not that I didn't do my job. It's that the, the data has problems with it. So I, that, that's kind of the background. That's where, where we're all coming from and, and why this got started in the first place. And then Gia responded to my email essentially with, with some, oh, it was very lengthy and well thought out email. And I tried to, to take his point of view and, and put it into a couple of slides. Gia, do you want to, do you want to go through any of this? These seem like your yeah. first principles that you were operating from. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, first of all, you know, credit where credit is due. I think the person who wrote the original article was Taylor Brownlow, seems to be the head of data at count, you know, super cool article. Uh, basically in the, in the newsletter, Tristan was like, Hey, does anyone have any thoughts? I was I have thoughts. I have, I have thoughts and feelings about this. <laughs> uh, so I typed up this huge thing without realizing, and I was, well, I guess it's just, I'll just send it now and, and see what happens. Uh, and then it, you know, sort of sparked this conversation, but, uh, yeah, we'd love to just quickly go through the slides and we can, we can get to talking. So I guess I really started from sort of just, and I've, I've built and led data at several startups at this point, you know, particularly focusing on the BI side. And in my experience, it's some, there's some good things to keep in mind that sort of set the context. Number one being reporting is not a technical problem. It's a people problem. I think this is really important because it's, it's often very tempting to say, you know, it's cause we're using the wrong tools, 
or you know we you know notebooks instead of dashboards or tableau instead of looker or whatever it may be uh, and i think while tools can make it easier ultimately it's very much a people problem you have to solve for what people are looking for and what they want out of data and understanding their limitations so just to quickly go through the rest of this while democratization is great pure democracy is anarchy if you give everyone you know access to all of the data you're going to get some wild stuff uh, because it, data is not always the most transparent or easy thing to use even if it's well documented and and well contextualized. Uh, poor curation leads to confusion, distrust, and waste. If you make bad dashboards, people are going to start being, wow, dashboards suck. I'm not into it. Uh, if, if you have bad data, they aren't going to trust your data anymore. And again, this being a people problem, uh, that's sort of the, the first thing you need to watch out for, uh, both as an, it, it's an indication of success and as a failure metric. Um, it's important to treat KPI reporting differently than ad hoc exploration. This is, this is actually a really, really important one. Uh, some people treat dashboards as a way to do ad hoc exploration. This is how you end up with a thousand filters, right? It's, hey, I want this dashboard. But I want to do all the stuff to the data. And it's, it's not the same, right? Dashboards, in my opinion, are meant to report a, a standardized, consistent set of metrics that are really used to drive the business. And generally speaking, it's pretty high level, right? Ad hoc exploration is a whole different thing where you want to go in there, you want to slice and dice. Uh, yeah, the right tool for the right job is really important here. And then finally, most people in the organization will lack technical ability and data literacy. This one's a spicy one. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about this, but just in my personal experience, unless you get really, really lucky and you have an organization filled with wonderful, wonderful data driven technical humans. A lot of the organization is not necessarily where they need to be to sort of do it, everything themselves. Uh, and I think in many ways, in my opinion, it's the power it is the responsibility of the data team to empower everyone to get what they want and what they need to do their jobs without all of the barriers, data barriers, context barriers, technical barriers. And I, I think that's really at the crux of a lot of this. Anyway, sorry, I, the spiel you, went way longer than anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's it's great to get all that out there. The uh, the thing I want to ask you before, yeah, I, I I put my own slide together. The kind of yeah. core, core beliefs I bring to this conversation. The do you think on the you know technical skills broadly mm -hmm. disseminated through the team topic? I feel that has actually we've made negative progress on that over the past 10 years. So in, in some ways, you know, 10 years ago, we were operating with smaller data sets and by and large, you know, the, okay, the workflows were bad. You emailed around Excel documents, but everyone knew how to, you know, at least in my experience, everyone knew how to take an Excel document and do some stuff with it. Everyone might have had slightly different levels of sophistication with, you know, I have been made fun of for using VLOOKUP when actually it's more sophisticated to do, I don't even remember what the other syntax there is. Yeah. But people had a set of tools that they kind of, sorry, Claire, index match. Yeah, yeah. Um, come on. Come on. <laughs> but everybody ha had a language that they could self-serve on top of to a certain extent. Do you feel, are we just at this weird spot where everything's retooling and there hasn't been this broad dissemination of, of this next generation of skills? I, I don't know. So I, I will say that I'm not super experienced with what it looked 10 years ago. Sure. Uh, I, I guess I was sort of born and raised in this new era of tooling, right? So just calling out my sort of inexperience and biases there. What I, what I will say is two things. Number one, as a data team, there are things in your control and out of your control. And I think one of the things that may often be out of your control is who you work with and who your customers are, who are your internal stakeholders, right? Sometimes those are people, especially in the leadership team who really know what they're doing and they know this is how to structure a metric to measure, you know, the outcome of an experiment that's going to drive the business. Right. And sometimes there are people who don't know that. And I think regardless of how good our tooling gets or how, how let's say technical or data literate people are, there's always going to be people within the organization who are not quite there yet. And I think, you know, optimizing for a world where 
you know, everyone can self-serve or everyone has that ability is, is probably not realistic just based on my personal experience. Fortunately, I think the other thing to keep in mind is even if someone can mess around with Excel or can hack it in SQL, doesn't mean they come out with the right thing. Oftentimes data is wonky. It's, oh yeah, you got to do this, well, that thing and this other thing. And you know, even when you look at tools, mode or Periscope, which are very much focused on, you know, SQL first, can I curate a lot of the initial steps and transformation to make some of the SQL based stuff later or SQL based stuff a bit easier, more consistent later, you still have these problems where it's, oh, you forgot to filter for this one thing. Or, and I, I just, I'm not completely sure that scaling up equals better decisions made with data. Uh, sure. There's a, there's some relationship uh, there, but that's not the full solve. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's totally fair. You know, I, I t here's my first bullet point. Yeah. <laughs> Humans are tool building and tool using creatures. Yeah. Uh, the, it has actually been proposed that the correct name, for, I, f I forget the, the Latin term, but the, the correct name for our species is not homo sapiens. It is actually uh, homo. And then the Latin word for tool builders. <laughs> um, but. I think that I probably over-index on this and I, I, I do think that there's, we could probably do better on self-service yeah. than we do today, self-service exploration. But, but I agree that, you know, a, no tool will ever solve the, the totality of like the problem that we're talking about. I think that the, one of the problems with dashboards as they exist today is that there's, you have to have a user intention to seek them out. Mm -hmm. um, whereas. You know, literally earlier today, we just rolled out Notion to our entire organization. Yeah, and Notion's great. We use it to do everything. Oh, beautiful. Touches I've, my heart. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a, a cranky old man. I've I've been using Trello and Google Docs for a long time. Oh no! And like, oh, you're teaching me to use new. Oh tools. no, Claire, um, I, I see you smiling. I know we're on the same page. <laughs> but but the reason that I I mentioned it is that you know we're having to think a lot as an organization at Fishtown Analytics, as we mm -hmm. grow very quickly and as we're, you know, all of us are very remote right now about how information flows through an organization. Yeah. And there's, it's just not a successful strategy to have people bookmark a lot of Looker dashboards and expect that they're just going to check them periodically. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not actively in the flow of, of information. And I yeah. think that Slack, having regular Slack shares is, is a good way to, to start to do this, some of that, but I, I still think there's something, something missing uh, there. I, I, first of all, I agree with you. I think it, when I've uh, approached this as data or reporting being a people problem, my answer to that has always been, you, you don't want outbound, you want inbound. And the only way you get that is you make dashboards that actually correlate to performance metrics, right? This has to matter for them. If a dashboard does not matter to someone, if the dashboard for the sales team or the AE does not actually correlate to their performance metrics and how they're going to get paid, no one's mm -hmm. going to look at it. On the other hand, if it does, and let's say you built a dashboard for customer success team, and this is how the out of head of customer success presents his metrics to the CEO, you're going to get a lot of traffic here. So I think it's, you're right that it's not a part of the knowledge flow. I think you have to, instead of moving the knowledge flow to the dashboard, you move the dashboard to the flow, if, if that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, wow, we're generating leads for Notion. I need, I need a referral code. Yeah, where's, where's that referral code? <laughs> <laughs> the, I'll, I'll skip over the next couple bullet points, but the, yeah. one of the things I, I always talk about, and this is, you know, maybe the, the very gentlest of, of barbs that I would throw at the, at the current ecosystem is that I think that, that because of the way some dashboard products, not the products themselves are built, but the way mm -hmm. that the businesses around them have been built is there, there is this inevitable desire to want to see a single dashboarding product as the main exploratory the tool for everything when it mm -hmm. comes to, you know, to, to exploring data and presenting dashboards, et cetera. Um, and, and part of that is just, be, it's a, it's very boring. It's a budget thing. You know, if, if you are designing a pricing strategy for a, a BI product, you 
say, well, we're going to try to price it such that an organization's willingness to pay for this category of tools, we're going to ask for, you know, right. we want to capture the get. entire wallet share, of course. Right, exactly. And, you know, I, I understand that. I'm not trying to blame anybody for, for doing that. But I think really there are actually multiple user intentions here. And you were talking about that a little bit. There's the KPI presentation. And that that's, I think, the, the best use case for uh, dashboarding products. But then sure. there's also this exploratory data analysis process that is not super well facilitated by current tooling. You can do it, but but there's it's hard for other entrants to come into the market because people's spend is already going to the existing set of tools. Yeah. So I, I think that, that there's underserved use cases here, I guess. Hmm. What what are some of the underserved use cases? I have I have thoughts, but I, I want to hear where you're coming from. Well, okay, so so there's maybe there's two. One is EDA, which is I have a data set, very quickly try to learn things about that data set and explore it. And I think mm -hmm. that the best way that I know of how to do that today is using a pandas data frame. Okay. You can actually explore data living in a pandas data frame much faster than, and, and you know, to a certain extent, a couple of the dashboard products have, have the ability to do Python oriented stuff in them. And so, okay, great. But it, it's just tremendously faster. And when you're trying to understand the surface area, then that's, that's very efficient. The other one is storytelling. I think that if you have gone through this entire exploratory data analysis process and you've tried this and tried that, and at the end of the day, you came to some conclusions, that's a story. And if you want to bring other people along, you need a storytelling presentation, not a dashboard presentation. Yep. So I, I agree with both of those things. So I'm not huge on Python myself. So I generally do my exploration in SQL. Python may be better. No, no huge preferences there. I guess in the context of BI reporting, I've always found the exploratory process to be, you know, I pay a lot of cost up front because I, I generally make, you know, me and my team spend a ton of time understanding the contest behind every single piece of data, right? Is that I can just spin it up because there's so much process context behind every field. Yeah, there was this one field was added because of that feature. Now it's deprecated because of this thing. So I guess moving fast there has never really been a huge priority for me because my answer has always been I'll model it, I'll document it, and then I'll expose it somewhere where people can use it faster. But I understand where you're coming from there. I agree with you on the storytelling. It's, it's hard. Storytelling just requires a flow and a context that I don't think anyone has really figured out yet. I think... Tools that do it better are generally use case specific data tools. So, you know, if you're using, I don't know, what's, what's a good example of this? I know there are a lot of BI tools that are more special purpose for sales and marketing. And it's a lot easier to say you should do your ad spend this way, or you should do your ad spend that way. Right. Because it's, it's so specific and we know exactly what you're trying to do. I also know a lot of tools that sort of promise the, you can type stuff in and it just gives you the answer. And I, I've never been a huge fan of that model. So I, I don't have a good answer. I agree with you that, you know, Tableau, Looker, all the other sort of best in class tools don't really do this. It's basically the way we've solved it is you get, you use Looker to get the data, you put it in PowerPoint to tell the story, which right. may not be the best answer. PowerPoint, the tool that will not die <laughs> yeah. uh, as I share my screen with a yeah. presentation. <laughs> The, uh, there've been some good, good comments in the chat. Yeah. I agree. It is hard to do data viz in notebooks. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience on the chat, but it, it is significant, at least for, for me and for my very limited skills with some of these tools, it is much easier to get the data set that I need inside of a Jupyter notebook and much harder to actually generate the chart that I'm looking for on top of that. The charting libraries are not, not super trivial to configure and use as well. The, the, the answer that I've found that, that I've been happiest with in the storytelling context is uh, modes interface does a yeah. decent job of giving you, you can create a bunch of queries and data sets and everything, and then you can create charts on top of them put them in flow, and then you can actually insert text in between those charts and, and use yeah. it to tell a story. It's clearly not exactly what they intended the product to do, but I found it, it works okay. Right. Yeah, and uh, technically you could probably do that with Looker too, if you're really 
working really hard and <laughs> you know explore yes. text explore mm -hmm. text i i guess my question would be you know how advanced of a user do you have to be to start using tools like that for storytelling right i when i think of the job of a data team i mean you do have a lot of different user classes right you have your lowest on the totem pole like i don't know what data is i'm scared of data users so they're really view only they look at dashboards maybe they click in sometimes right you have your power users within those teams so that i am the data person on the sales team and i can i can mess around a little bit i'm slightly dangerous you have your data analysts who you know know what they're doing they're generally hired to actually do that data job and then you know you have your power i i can do whatever i want and whatever tool i want cuz I've, i've done this a lot and it's i think the storytelling part of it you know who who's actually doing that job right now maybe is a good question is it just data analysts doing that job uh because the people below them don't have the like tools or the ability to do it cuz not everyone can just go into python and mess around uh, even if you taught them python it would there's always the question of is this their job and does the business want them spending time on this right and i i love empowering people but if I'm trying to help an AE really class up and his managers you aren't hitting sales goals. I'm done. <laughs> it's it's over. I we he can't spend time there. So, yeah. I don't know what yeah. do you think. Greg, I I really one of the the comment that you made in chat. It is that is one of the things that I've run into in my abortive attempt to do do storytelling. There's this you you create some data assets and you have narrative text in between them. And then the next time you hit run on the report the data assets update and now the narrative may no longer be relevant and so what you actually need is you need i'm imagining you know we just went through our our board meeting last week and i'm imagining it, what if i could write a a story that i know that the board meeting is always going to have these five charts as a part mm -hmm. of it but every month or whatever for us it's every quarter i would want to snapshot those those charts at that point in time and like write new narrative between them. And so you always have narr narrative that matches the the data assets. Yeah. That, yeah. that I'm, feels I'm, I'm an infinitely pragmatic guy. I you know, it's it's possible it's it, yeah, it's not that hard to powerpoint, right? I just screenshot description, screenshot description. We got <laughs> it done, right? It's yeah. I yeah, I yeah. don't disagree. I'm sure Looker could some could come up with some sort of special dashboard export mode that does this. I uh I guess that's that's not necessarily the core problem that I have been trying to solve. Yeah, I think that's fair. The uh, I want to give you a chance to you had a lot of thoughts on how how you feel some of these problems get get solved really well. Yeah. Um, yeah, go for it. So, this is super super generic sort of high level version of solving these problems, so, you know, to take it take it with a grain of salt and uh, I don't know, a biscuit if you're in, you know chilling but yeah you know, i think the way that i've tried to approach solving the problems really breaks down to these sort of three things curation being number one yeah you know, i think it it's tempting oftentimes to just make your own dashboard right or solve your own problems uh, i think oftentimes to really empower people and, and to engender the right sort of trust you have to really cut down the scope of what you do into just the most important things and the most useful things and you know you can solely expand outwards but you just i've always i've always found the best way to do it is you you start with your executive kpi dashboards and i think everyone has heard this before this is literally the timeline for every single how do you do bi article ever but you know make sure that people trust your content because you only have trustworthy content um, context is really important always give context and I think it takes a long time to add descriptions to every piece of data. I also think it's actually a really worthwhile exercise. Tell people why it's important. And of course, complexity, this is this is my whole thing about you know, create systems with low barriers to entry. As uh, you need to serve everyone in the organization and you do have people on every place of the totem pole in in organizations. So it it has to be they can just click on it. They have to just understand it. that's sometimes a design problem sometimes a context problem 
uh, and you architect these the data discovery patterns. So, you know, maybe the exploration experience is not perfect, but, and, you know, you know, a bias is on the table. I'm, I'm a fan of Looker. You sort of, you can create the right sort of exploration pattern from a dashboard. So it's dashboard into exploration, still using the underlying sort of curated model that you've built and you get people generally going the right direction. Oh. I don't know. Anything, anything we should talk more about there? What do you think, Tristan? I want to, we've gotten some good, good stuff in chat. Um, yeah. I want to open up the conversation a little bit. The, does, does anyone want to, uh, to add to this or to, you know, let's, let's be controversial. Do you want to tell Gia that he's, he's got something wrong? Yeah. Well, what are those hot takes though? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, f feel free to, let me see. Danny, do you, do you want to, I'll, I'll your, your add on there. Do you want to say anything more? No, that's about it, but it's, it's very important not to pollute and have hundred thousand dashboards. You know, it's, it's better to have one with the right context than there are thousand ones for a thousand different use cases. Yeah. And, and candidly, you... sorry, go ahead, Tristan. I was just going to ask you, do you have, uh, you know, I can imagine people finding it a little hard to adjust to if their dashboards start getting deleted by some central data team that says you don't make the cut of usefulness. Like do you... <laughs> the, the big brother of data. Yeah. <laughs> right. Do you train people to expect some, some type of thing that we're going through it a little bit right now. And you know, the good thing is that when people see things going wrong, they understand, you know, when, when you don't know what the source of truth is, and then you tell them, you know, this is source of truth, but you'll just, you'll have to use that one. I think people understand if, if you try to do that before they see it as a problem, yeah, then it's, it's much harder to, to sell them on that. But yeah, it would be better not to get into the problem to begin with. <laughs> I think part of it is also when you delete uh, content seeking forgiveness rather than permission, because if you ask someone which dashboards are most important to you, they're going to say all of them. Yeah. Which, uh, I've it's a really challenging thing to be. So two of the times I've done this are, sort of gone from the ground up, I, I set expectations in advance and it was nice, easy sort of roll out. Everyone knew what the game plan was. One time I was coming in after, and that was quite a challenge. This is no joke. It's, you can't delete their content without having a replacement, right? So a lot of it is, yeah, it's the people problem, right? How do I, how do I escalate to my leadership team and their leadership team that there's something wrong with the data, right? So how do I, how do I make sure that they understand that they might be making the wrong decisions? How do I articulate the value of creating a dashboard on my side and how do we get the resources to do that all within the right amount of time? It's, I mean, I, I've always thought of BI and data as product. If you think of it as a product team, it's, I have this roadmap, right? I have all of my stakeholders. You get a ton of pressure to build a ton of dashboards and you prioritize in the right way. And, you know, you kind of go from there. So do you yeah. wait, I'm trying to catch up with chat the, uh, I'm going to butcher with the pronunciation of your name, Rogier, Rogier. How do I say it? Yeah. You just call me Roger. Roger. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, you've, you've had some super insightful comments throughout you. You said created by tech and not the real PO. What's PO? Uh, product owner. Uh, Got it. Yeah. I, I get, yeah. So I guess the thing is that that's still uh, what I see having been in this business for 20 years. I, I, I think I see the same problem being repeated for 20 years. And that's still that uh, a lot of these products that are called self-service products. So uh, they're, the idea is that the end user really creates, creates them, but they're still being built a lot by tech and by how tech things and what they think is valuable data and as such this tendency to still create end user products that are not really actionable i think you also mentioned that uh, alexander yeah if it's not really actionable if it doesn't lead to a real action then people stop using it and you get this proliferation of 
uh, humongous amount of, of dashboards, reports, whatever. And the first thing that people will use is export to Excel because somehow there is something missing in that yeah. report. It's still not what they want. And they kind of create, still got to create their own stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. so much of that classic product problem, right? Like how, how do you serve their needs? You, if you treat your data team like IT help desk, you are in for a world of pain. Like that's not going to be fun for anyone. I think a lot, a lot of it is, you know, I think you just see, you have to set the right expectations and it's not the sort of thing where you can go in and force it on people super well. It has to be a top down thing to some degree. Yeah. The convinced leadership that having the right data is important having well curated, well designed dashboards. So many people don't really think about design of dashboards enough and just being comfortable pushing back when necessary. I was reading the chat here, you know, how do you bridge the gap? Well, in, in the context of product, how do you bridge the gap for your customers not having the features they need, even though they're later down the pipeline? I guess, uh, I think, you know, they have their ways of doing it now. There's always this sort of push and pull of, do I put in a short-term solution, which is a simple scheduled report, which goes straight to the Excel and they can do whatever they need before we get to the dashboard part? How do we partner there, right? Can we find the stakeholders and talk to them and, you know, get them to test the content and all that stuff? It, it's a longer process. I think it definitely pays off a lot more. Yeah, I think it has to do a lot still with education. I mean, we've seen over the last 10, 10 years, the focus on education is people wanting to do data science and make end user stuff, make cool visualizations, whereas people working with data know that the real work is in data modeling creation. What is the meaning of data? What is actually defines a customer? How is that consistent across uh, all those things that nobody wants to talk about only up? Uh, except a few things, master data management, and it's all quite boring. It can be quite boring, but <laughs> still, it's, a, it's, all, it's still very important if you want to create good information. And, yeah. and of course, you have the distinction between KPIs and exp exploratory analysis, right? But yeah. I was, so Michelle, you took the thought right out of my brain. I, I haven't actually gotten to read your whole comment yet, but, but to me, I wonder if there's two different spaces. There's the, you know, Looker has its shared spaces. I think that Moat has a similar concept. And then there's your personal space. I don't actually remember if stuff that's in your personal space is broadly visible or if only you can see it. Um, it de but depends on how you have your settings set up. Yeah. Okay. Is there a role for, you know, here's your, your workbench over here and you can do whatever the hell you want there. And then there's a space that this heavily, everybody seems to be a huge fan of heavy curation on this call, which means that everybody's on data teams and is used to squashing the hopes and dreams of <laughs> their business stakeholders. But yeah, is there, are there two different worlds here? Yeah. Um, Michelle, do you want to, I, I know that you wrote that comment. Oh yeah, I mean, I can just chime in saying that we definitely separate those two worlds. The shared space is our child, it's our baby, it's our product at the end of the day. So it's heavily curated. It definitely introduces bottlenecks in the short term, but I think it really just works out in the long term in terms of maintenance and making sure that people aren't misinterpreting anything. So definitely a big fan of separating those two. Yeah, M Michelle and I have definitely talked about this over drinks at some point during data dinner, I think. <laughs> uh, it was the curation hard. Uh, Hub and Spoke is an interesting model. You know, the whole, can we outsource a part of this while you have a gold set standard of dashboards? I've, I've always found a lot of inherent risk there. Not, not that I don't think it's worth trying, but you know, you opened the floodgates of, all right, now I've created my own dashboards. I'm just going to copy paste this one. And I think maybe a more fundamental question, and this is, you know, credit where credit's due. So a while back, I was getting coffee with Scott, uh, right now they ex-head of data at Casper, head of data, or C, sorry, CEO founder of Brooklyn Data Co. And he asked me, you know, as the data team, are you responsible for making sure people use data correctly? Like, are you actually accountable for that or are you not? And I think this is, this really hits at the crux of it. Cause if you are not responsible and accountable for it, if everyone's sort of on their own, you do your best, but you know, whatever. Okay. Then none of this matters, right? You, you give the people what they want. And if they mess up, that's not your problem. If you are accountable 
the bar is just so high, right? And I think it's very, very hard to be accountable without having a lot of centralization. I don't want to call it control, a curation, right? But making sure that things are done in the right way, that things are thought out, it'll take longer, but then you can actually sit there and be at peace, or at least I can be at peace with myself knowing that people are probably not using data incorrectly at this organization. So, Josh, thanks for hopping on. It's fun to, fun to hang out. I, I want to throw out, you know, we're, we're kind of solidly living, this conversation is living in, in the present. And I think that to the extent that we're all also living in the present and solving problems <laughs> in the present, that's a useful conversation to have. I want to throw out a question that might be controversial, but you know, it is kind of where a little bit where my head is, is living these days. So Facebook circa 2010 was not an algorithmic product. You just, you had a feed and it was reverse chronological and you just went there and you got whatever stuff you got. And now for better or probably in this context for worse, Facebook's product is heavily algorithmic and the, 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 that ecosystem has driven behavior in a certain way, but you could imagine internally how in, in, in a company that, that used modern data tooling, you could imagine that there could be algorithmic ways to surface things that are of high quality. I don't know whether that means they are engaged with or they receive high NPS or whatever. But do you think that there is ultimately, uh, rather than humans going around and saying, I'm deprecating your report or anything, is, is there a way to automatically bubble up the things that are the data assets, whether they're tables or dashboards or whatever, that are creating value in an organization? I actually think a lot of tools try to do that. So Looker has their whole recommended thing. I, yeah, Lyfts, Amundsen, absolutely. I think the scary part of that is you know, what, what defines, what is your algorithm, right? Just because a lot of people use it does not mean it's good, right? Just, just because it's, you know, high MPS does not mean it's the right data. It's again, I, I, I always get sort of sketchy about that. So, well, you know, if, if someone with the background hasn't gone in there and vetted it, then I don't know what it is. It, it may very well be correct, but you know, who's responsible if it's wrong. Uh, so I, yeah. maybe, yeah. And, and the other thing is, I think it's important to understand why people want the data. I, I can surface something that's interesting to you or just interesting in general, right? And a lot of people in the company are looking at it, but I think what matters most is to always create content that correlates directly to people's jobs. Right? So instead of trying to surface interesting things to you, can I just create a dashboard that is, you know, catered to exactly answering the questions that you need answered as a part of your normal day to day, you can explore if you want, but this is exactly what you need. If you can do that. And if this dashboard is the first thing to log into every day, and this is how they measure their performance, then I feel you couldn't be in better shape. But yeah, it's a very human effort. So it's people problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, did, I'm curious, there's been some good, yeah, Claire, you mentioned Amundsen. I think that they, they've done some interesting work there. I've seen, I think it's, I thought I saw Elation's type ahead suggestions on their joins. I am curious if anybody has direct experience using any type of, uh, recommender type stuff who's, who's on this, on this call. No, it sounds like we've all read about it. Oh, Kristen, I can jump in there. I've, I've used yeah. it and I, it wasn't a, a great experience. It was a few years ago. So, you know, I, I don't want to talk too negatively about them. The product might have changed, but I was at a company that had Alicia set up when I joined and the way it did recommendations was basically whichever users or, or at least a, a primary factor in the recommendations was whoever is most active on given assets, it would, it would recommend as the people who are most knowledgeable about those assets, which is, is great when, you know, knowledge and activity are correlated with each other. 
unfortunately at this company, we had some people who went around doing all kinds of ad hoc analysis, often, you know, not using the right data sources. And so, you know, Alicia would promote up, you know, so-and-so is the most knowledgeable person about this table that, you know, really nobody should ever be using for analytics. And, and, and it, it kind of perpetuated the problem of people, things, things that were created that uh, didn't, that weren't well validated then getting disseminated further. Sure. Sure. And look, if, if your company is filled with data literate, highly technical subject matter experts, then that is a great way of doing recommendation. <laughs> I yeah. just, you know, how many of us work in organizations that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much a people problem. The signals are bad if the people uh, problems haven't been fixed. Yeah. Hey, Gio, was that Scott's answer as well? Should the head of data be responsible for people's usage of data? I don't remember Scott's answer. It was, it was yeah. late. We're having burritos and beer or something, but uh, I just, that yeah, question. I was asking Jay for the answer. He wanted to know himself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. I, it might've just been like a random comment for him, but that, that drilled deep for me. I was, I was sitting there with my burrito. Oh, man, do we, are we accountable? <laughs> it's a uh, big stuff. Um, Grant, you, you're a, a little back in the chat. You said that there's a feedback loop where the decisions don't don't end up back in the BI layer. Can can you say a little bit more about that? I'm I'm curious about loops in data. Sure. Yeah. So uh, a lot of the recommendation I think that's been discussed thus far is based around frequency of use or something like that, and I think everyone is rightfully been a little skeptical of that. I think it would be more interesting this to force people into more of this critical thinking mindset that's come up in the chat too, through trying to have very concrete data-driven goals around using data. So rather, this is why part of why dashboards are, are kind of rough is there's this passive constant usage of them. That's why are you, why are you looking at this? What are you going to do differently based on what you're looking at? and express that in terms of a goal or a query that is also a metric. And then the data that you use and the impact on that metric of using that data can form some kind of, obviously there's issues with causation and things there, and then there's a lot to tease out, but creating some sort of link there where quality is measured based on impact rather than frequency of use. It's interesting. It's, there's a recommender system that doesn't actually have any signals to work off of. The Netflix recommender knows whether you actually watch the thing or not. You know? Right, right. So it's pulling data to, you know, lower customer acquisition costs, but it's not actually feeding back into if what they're doing is lowering customer acquisition costs in any kind of scalable automated way. Totally. Mm -hmm. I, I have two thoughts about that. So number one, so I've left the data world kind of doing co-founded, doing product for a data product in the fintech space. And a big part of what we care about is building actions into the way we surface data, because that's how we get our signals. With normal BI tools, your dashboards don't tie to actions. So you don't get meaningful signals. And I think that's going to be just a, a really hard sell. I mean, Looker has Looker Action, which kind of does something. Uh, but unless you can actually complete that sort of data analysis, action feedback loop, you, it's really hard to build something that for sure. And I forgot what my other thought is, but <laughs> I'm sure it was a great one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, that's almost a dauntingly large problem. There's, there's a ton of things that I'm just, oh yeah, I could imagine how within the two to five year time frame, how the modern data stack could evolve to, to do that kind of stuff. But that I, I, it doesn't, to me, Grant, the thing that you bring up is not, oh, I know how one might solve that. It's just, yeah, that much, is a problem and also not obvious. Yeah, much easier expressed as a problem than a solution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I suspect what's going to happen next in, in the world of data is not necessarily better tools for the data team or better things on the, the data side, but other platforms catching up. So, you know, Google is going to get better at recommending know, the right ad distribution for you. What we're building something for accounts payable. So, you know, your accounts payable software is better at servicing the data and helping you save money. 
right? I think there's, there's so much room to grow in those spaces, maybe versus a generic, can I show KPIs type deal, but I'm biased because I'm, you know, sort of trying to grow that company right now. So we'll see. <laughs> Tegan, do you want to jump in real quick? You've, you've had a couple of oh, great comments on this. No, sounds like no. No, no, he's here. Oh. Sorry, just a little bit of. I doubt. It's like his Tegan, connections all. Yeah, spicy. Tegan, I think we're having trouble with your audio, but appreciate appreciate your your <laughs> contributions in chat. Yeah, Claire, I mean, I, I, I oh, sorry, go sorry. Go, go ahead, Justin. No, no, are you? <laughs> yeah, I know. I was just gonna say, I agree with that. As a people problem, if you hire a culture of a bunch of data literate people, of, of course you're going to have a great time, right? It's, you don't have to explain a lot of this to them, they just get it. It's, I think there's always that sort of infinite pressure between, you know, does it really matter if every single person on my team is at that bar of data literacy? Or do I need to hire for people who are good at sales to do the sales job or the marketing job to do the marketing job? And that's sort of obvious trade-offs there that need to be made. Yeah. Really appreciate everyone hopping on. This is a fun conversation. I, I think that this, this has left me with uh, a much greater respect for the, the, the human complexity involved in, in like solving, solving these problems. I still, I still think that there, there is incremental progress to be made on the, on the tooling side for sure. But, but agree that, that people is at, at least half, if not, it's significantly more than half of, of the problem.